Thank you so much. Uh, so let's get started. So this is the topic that I was given to talk about, the causes of the patch, what to do now. Now, I have nothing to disclose. So one thing that I usually do, I speak a lot. So I like to put the last slide first, so nobody needs to miss anything about the whole talk. So when we talk about the Crohn's disease and the pouch, we really need to know about what exactly what defining as a Crohn's disease. So it's very important to know and look at the history, history, history. When the patients come to my office and everything after going through the hell two, three, five years or so, they try to give the every record. I just like to tell them, let's, let's talk. What happened after the surgery? Because the first three months to six months to a year after the initial pouch surgery is very critical, what we call exactly Crohn's or not. What does the patient want? What are the multidisciplinary workup findings showed, whether this was a mechanical or is it really a Crohn's disease? And what are the revised or reconstruct options that we need to know? They're all on the table. But this needs to be complemented with the good gastroenterology colleagues that we work together with liberal medical therapy if concerns of the disease is high. And the, both the patient and the institution, because this is not about a one, two man show, this is about the institutional infrastructure supporting the people who wants to commit on these patients who develop the Crohn's disease of the pouch, that this may be a lifelong relationship. Personal experience, I had the privilege of serving 20 patients with proven Crohn's disease in small bowel plus mild perianal disease, and it's open to discussion because it's evolving. Mild is one fistula, it's okay to have multiple tracts, who are on biologics, but were, were three lost to pouch due to Crohn's disease, rest are well with two years follow-up and doing well right now. Prefer, prefer, no presence of small bowel disease or perianal disease. However, we'll consider in limited present or history of small bowel disease and perianal disease, excluding rectovaginal fistula or multiple draining abscesses and multiple fistulas. The concept of the Crohn's disease and the redo pouch, it needs to be a patient-driven thing. It needs to not be a surgeon-driven uh, idea. And hopefully, we'll collectively work together to give a better answer in the sitting. This is the thing that I like to teach to my residents and the fellows uh, you know, the, that I had the opportunity to train. Number one rule, this is a Ramsey principle. If the pouch fails and the patient is absolutely happy with a good quality of life with a stoma, trying to convince them for a redo pouch is the greatest disservice that you can do to these patients. So this needs to be a patient-driven agenda. Ramsey principle number two, however, however, when cannot live happily, one cannot live happily, good quality of life with a stoma, trying to convince them, get the pouch out. It's better off for you not to have the pouch anymore is also a great disservice. So it needs to be a collective commitment work when we serve these patients for the redo J pouches. When you talk about the Crohn's disease of the pouch and what to do, the reoperative surgery comes as a, you know, the likely chose uh, you know, the, other than the, some medical therapy or diversion uh, or the excision, which will be talked later. So number one principle of the reoperative pipe surgery is the humility and, and also the teamwork, and you gotta respect the patient, patient's pathology and the unpredictability. You have to have the same OR, st OR staff in these surgeries, strategize, or you got to see the things a couple steps ahead, and repetition is the mother of the skills, and there's a, if this is a surgery that needs to be done in teams that practice it, does it every day collectively as a group. Now, I'd like to give you a story, and this is the problem in our country when we come to the j pout surgery. This goes on sadly, and we just like to blame each other, and some of these examples were, were given by Dr. Kornblut yesterday. This is a 53-year-old uh, Texan woman with a 20 years of ulcerative colitis that presented with low-grade dysplasia. Surgery 2003, one-stage ileal pouch anal anastomotic, no ileostomy and mucosectomy. So this is really the problem when we talk about the previous sessions about diversion, no diversion, everything. We gotta be careful with the message that we are giving to the whole country. Because when you do these things rarely, you do a no mucosectomy, on top of that with no ileostomy, that's called looking for a trouble on the patient's behalf. And this patient had uh, multiple anastomotic dilatations, and uh, she, she presents, like in July of 2003, six months after surgery with complex fistula, they have given an ileostomy, but closed the ileostomy, then fistula is back in the perineal. Guess what? The surgeon slash the ego said, now nah, this Crohn's disease, everything healed, get the biologics going on. 
So she was treated with a good amount of biologics and then was sent to us for a further evaluation and management. So what's the general principles of that? Check your own footsteps before you call something a Crohn's disease or the Crohn's disease of the pouch. Did patient have a perioperative septic complication? When did the issues pouch dysfunction started? If the issues started related to pouch dysfunction within the six months after the initial surgery, that's likely a mechanical issue to the surgery rather than being labeled as a Crohn's disease. But if the patient really did well a year or two and suddenly the issue started, that's likely a Crohn's disease. We work these patients up with the proper gastrograph and enema, pelvic MRI, eczema under anesthesia, flexible pouchoscopy, and strategize it collectively with my partners, Dr. Chang and Dr. Hudusman, to see how to proceed with these patients. Because this is really an issue that uh, when I was in uh, Cleveland, we looked at uh, one of our fellows now, uh, she's in Cornell, Dr. Kelly Garrett, look at, we get these patients called Crohn's disease because the, pa you know, to, 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 I don't know, I'm trying to blame my colleagues, but really, they get blamed as, you know, the Crohn's by the surgeons, then goes to gastroenterologist, and the gastroenterologist says, hey, I need help here, can you guys see any alternatives? So we found the fact that 80% of these patients, 26 patients, overall 10 years or 15 years, were misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease. They were candidate for a redo pouch, and then seven of them ultimately had diagnosed of Crohn's disease, but even in that setting, even in that setting, and this is gonna open the discussion of our recent study, five with retained pouch and favorable outcomes. So this is the study that made me say, maybe, maybe a pouch can be an option redo pouch in these settings. We recently looked at this, uh, our, our, uh, you know, the study at the NYU as a group. Uh, uh, this is uh, submitted to the Surgical Society of Elementary Track and DDW. Uh, we'll see what happens, but the numbers are going up. So this is the history of that thing. This is like 25 months period. So we had 77 patients we had the privilege of taking care of uh, overall, but 52 of them were referred to us as a Crohn's disease and were treated a long time with Crohn's disease beforehand. So far, 43 had a redo. Uh, you know, nine are being uh, prepared for a redo EUA. Pouch rotation said around 98%, but it's really a short-term study, so we need to be transparent about that. One failed, but again, they may have, they may have uh, actual Crohn's disease, four proven to be a Crohn's disease, and so far they are doing well, and the pouch is still going on. So what is the message? We gotta be very careful what we exactly call in Crohn's disease, or chronic pouchitis, and how our gastroenterologists treating these years and years with the medical therapy, actually it's the surgical mechanical issue giving these patients the problem. So we have to separate that too. So when you get these patients, Crohn's or non-Crohn's, for a redo, you gotta really be careful about what you're doing. The first stage is you need to divert these patients beforehand because they're miserable, they got fistula, they got abscess, they're deconditioned, so is the family. They're wasting all their fiscal resources to avoid this permanent back. So I like to do that time out. Let's give you a temporary back, divert you, and see how the things look like. And we can decide either you can live with the ileostomy in six months, or if you prefer to give another shot at it, once again, this needs to be a patient-driven issue. We can come back and do a redo pouch down the line. So initially, and this is very important, sometimes they tell me, you know, can my surgeon do it in the local area? Absolutely, I have them to give me a call, but I like to give some, you know, the idea and the strategy because the art of reoperative surgery is about seeing the things a couple steps ahead. So I call this a total ileostomy for a patients who are gonna need a potential redo J pouch or redo pouch in the setting of Crohn's disease or not. I like to have them the ileostomy to be 20 centimeter upstream of the de novo pouch in there. Because why? 60% of the time that I can use the old pouch in this uh, setting, 60%. 40% I have to make a new pouch in this setting. So in order to facilitate that the pouch may be excised, the idea of doing the J, you know, the ileostomy is 20 centimeters above. You don't want to do the pouch here. You don't want to do the pouch here. Excuse me, you don't want to do the ileostomy here. You don't want to do the ileostomy here. What happens then, you have to go all the way up there to do the new J pouch. So you can use this hole that you use to create the ileostomy and swing it down and make a new pouch if you cannot use the old pouch itself. So this is the view of the pelvic sepsis and excision 
uh, of that sepsis when you're doing a redo pouch that you need to excise that crut. If you're doing a redo pouch in a chronic infection or sepsis related to Crohn's or not, that if you don't excise that thing, nothing is going to work. So I think it's very important to disconnect it, don't kid yourself, and then 60% of the time you can hopefully get the things you know, the, in that setting. You need to go to the next one for me. I can't do it from here. Thank you. Yeah. So some of these patients are referred to us as quote unquote Crohn's disease. And this is I was a 10-year-old girl that from Kansas, you know, four years of treatment with biologics and everything, and pure laparoscopy. I'm not anti-laparoscopy, I'm actually a pro-laparoscopy, but it's not the tool, it's the aim that matters. So I was able to at the end, you know, convince the mom look, let's just explore what's going on. They closely asked me twice that she gets into the major obstruction. They said, you got a pelvic floor issue, you know, just live with the ileostomy, nine-year-old. So we got in there, and this is the finding that what we found. What the issue is here, humility is number one of surgery, because my, one of my mentors, uh, Kryle's uh, son-in-law, used to say that, Feza, somebody is all gonna tap your shoulder on and off, and he's gonna tell you, or she's gonna tell you, you're not in charge, so you need to be humble. So this was a twisted pouch that was anastomosed to the anus. So we disconnected it and untwisted it, and she's four years out, uh, blossoming teenager right now, uh, doing uh, great. So uh, that's the thing. And this is, again, another patient who was, quote, unquote, referred as a Crohn's disease, but this is called converting an ulcerative proctocolitis to ulcerative proctitis, putting a pouch on top of that by leaving the whole rectum behind just to do a shortcut with the MIS technique. I beg you to hear me. I'm not suggesting that we should be opening everybody up to do a formal open laparotomy, but we should be, have a common sense. What is a rectum? What's a colon? This is another one. This is a controversy with some of my colleagues uh, that we a a agree to disagree, that I'm a big proponent of excising the meso itself rather than leaving behind, because that may leave an area of you shoving the pouch in there that may impact their pouch distension and creates a potential problem in these settings and infects the inflammation, I think, at least in my point. So this is a revision. Once again, a patient was treated as a Crohn's disease for a long time. This is a 14-year-old young gentleman that, who had a ulcerative proctitis. Again, it can happen to many of us. It happened to me, too. It's an evolving cure. So this was uh, like removing the remnant rectum, dissecting the things, and we were able to restaple it down below. That's what we did there. So we were able to remove that remnant rectum and brought the a small bowel down to the uh, perineum, did a hands-on anastomosis, and he's like three or four years out and doing well uh, right now. Uh, no voice, no voice. That's too much. So this is this is a lower the lady. So this is a patient. We drained the abscess for quote unquote again a Crohn's disease that she was labeled. That's a chronic abscess. Uh, you know, I also used the endo sponge as a cheap man's endo sponge that we developed at the NYU as a technique to manage these leaks. But this was an old uh, patient of mine that we used the mushroom catheter, leave it like uh, 12 months or so. This was referred uh, from uh, out of town. There is that chronic infection crut, and this is the infection I was referring to that related to whatever reason that you need to excise it before you can consider a, a, a J pouch. This is, if you don't excise that crut in the pelvis, nothing is going to heal. This is very important. And trying to shove the pouch through this chronically infected area is going to be really uh, futile. So we're exercising this crut, but this patient at the end sat to say she did develop Crohn's disease, and I had to actually divert her. Uh, she was from uh, New York area. So they came to see us, and I did divert her. But excising this crut is incredibly important to succeed itself, to push the pouch in there. Uh, again, this is uh, uh, to, uh, one of my first uh, patients at NYU referred to us once again, quote unquote, Crohn's disease after the ileostomy closure, something unknown sepsis. What can be seen here, there was actually a leak in the body of the pouch, made it to go down, stuck to the pelvis, and we had to revise it and repair it, and we were able to successfully handle the problem. This was our result. This three do pouches can be done in experienced uh, hands with good results. Uh, could you go to the next one? There is a technical glitch here, the next slide. You may need to come out of the PowerPoint and came back. Just, 
just come out from the PowerPoint and restart the PowerPoint again. No, no good. So this, this patients did have a, uh, you know, the, uh, they had a good results out there. And go to the next one now. Yeah, thank you so much. With a, you know, 10 year of a, a pouch survival over 80 percent. And this is pretty uh, good uh, number that uh, I had the privilege to serve uh, over 300 of these 500 patients. So uh, I am very optimistic about this uh, potential option with a good quality of life. Now, this is the the uh, recent uh, work that we have done uh, with one of our residents then, and Dr. Ashburn, uh, who is in uh, Winston, uh, North Carolina right now, that what happens when these patients actually develop the Crohn's disease, but is it worth trying? One thing is that we're still not sure whether this is really 100% of Crohn's disease. So we compared the outcome and the methods in that sense that inclusion criteria, these patients need to have three of the things. Either they had preoperatively pre known Crohn's disease before the index pouch. Patients with Crohn's disease at the, after, at the time of the J pouch procedure, which means that we did a two-stage J pouch and subsequent the fact that the patient's J pouch failed. And the third option is the toughest one, patients who had their diagnosis changed to Crohn's disease later, what we call the delayed disease, which is the toughest thing to manage. The exclusion criteria, FAP cancer, small bowel Crohn's disease, perineal disease, but this is, again, it's an evolving concept, concept excluding the small bowel Crohn's disease, excluding perineal disease. What we try to say in that exclusion criteria, limited uh, extensive small bowel disease or extensive perianal disease. So here's the results. Two groups we did, the index IPAA with the Crohn's disease and the redo revisionary IPAA. Patients' characteristics and part survival were looked at. But we look at that, we had the index J patch with the Crohn's disease out of the 4,000 patients that we published uh, in uh, colorectal disease last year. Look at these results, and we did compare to the redo pouch patients who we labeled them as a Crohn's, uh, and we are putting them through a redo J pouch in the setting of Crohn's disease we compared the two. Median follow-up was, of course, there was some difference itself because after that study that I started to push the limit in the setting of these Crohn's disease by doing the redo pouches. So indications were there, and this is the results. When we compare the results after the redo, comparing to an index Crohn's uh, J pouch patients, the results were very equivalent. So is the functional outcomes and the survival. And this is really tell you that you, we can make an argument, are these patients really Crohn's or not? I think it is, when you talk about a 10 year of 40% of survival rate, and this is the transparency and honesty about. Once again, I want to reiterate, this cannot be a surgeon driven agenda, but we need to respect our patients' opinion. There are some patients out there that who tells me, I like to give it a try. Even this means it means two, three, five years that I avoid the back, I just want to know. And I think that's a fair shot to give them as long as we have a mutual intellectual understanding what the expectations are. So the results are what I would call not great, but it depends on what you call great for the patient. It's around 60% for five years. It's around 90% for one year that these patients may not need to have a permanent back. So these are the results. The Crohn's recurrence is real. Uh, it, the numbers are small, so it didn't become a statistical significance, but it's up there. So this is the conclusion. I do believe a redo IP is a feasible and a safe procedure for highly selected, and I want to underline this, motivated patients with Crohn's colitis. I do, once again, this should not be a surgeon-driven agenda. There is a high risk of fistula, sepsis, and pouchitis in addition to Crohn's recurrence. With the limitation of a shorter follow-up, redo IPAA avoids permanent elastic with comparable quality of life and functional outcomes in the, study, in the setting of Crohn's development of the, the, the pouch after the J-pouch procedure. Once again, the volume, I think it's important. In the last 25 months, we had the privilege of uh, doing 92 redo pouches and 95 index pouches in that study. Uh, majority patients do come out of uh, town and uh, the 30-day mortality between the index and the redo pouch. I'm showing this number 
as a safety of the redo pouch when you work as a team, as a group, that you can obtain good results. Readmission rates is the same. Reoperation rate is pretty much the similar. Medium follow-up, 13 months, one failure in each group. I think this is a good option to consider. Again, so it has been a privilege being in this meeting again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.